So just one reminder that uh, this, this series, this is just obviously kind of a short edited clips of the series, is just one of many uh, different kinds. Of, these are some targeted for kids, obviously, primarily, but Bible studies that are available to you for free through Right Now Media. And so if you're not uh, connected with Right Now Media, what you would like to be, uh, that's something that you can have access to for free. All you need to do is to email me and Again, my email address is in the bulletin. So today, uh, we're turning the page to Leviticus, as you, uh, as you heard them speak of. Uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 5 is where I'm going to read from this morning. Leviticus 18, verse 1. Again, it's up on the screen here if you like to follow along that way. We read, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes, to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a person follows them, then he will live by them. I am the Lord. Now, just a quick, I didn't put this in the notes, but I think about this because my wife said this to me this week, and I've heard a couple other people mention this too. Uh, How's everybody feeling about flipping into the book of Leviticus? We got one thumbs up, but so it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, I will just say my wife was not the first, wife was not the first person to talk about how it's a real page turn. So yeah, there, there's definitely aspects of reading that are harder than others. And so I want to just, this is a great time for me to again, encourage you to just keep pressing on. And I hope that in my message today, you'll get a sense uh, of why all of these rules were put out there. What, how do we respond when someone says, well, you want me to continue to obey the Ten Commandments, but you don't obey this rule that was written down here? Why is that? So these are questions that come up in people's minds all the time about how do we wade through all of the rules in the sense that God presented, some of which are refined in the book of Leviticus. So last week, we talked about how God instructed the Israelites to build a mobile tabernacle so that they could offer daily sacrifices for their sin and to worship God. It was so that God could dwell among his people. And I pointed out that just like not opening a package and just staring at the wrapping paper, if we left it as a physical building, we're missing out on the greater gift that the tabernacle represented. And that God has pitched a tent in each of us, and he longs to dwell in each of us. Either way, the tabernacle quickly became part of the Israelite, or became the center of the Israelite society. So as you finished reading through the book of Exodus, you saw how God pointed Israel towards being holy. In how they lived, and so he created a system for them to make people clean and acceptable in his presence. Now today, we're going to look at how God chose to separate the Hebrews from the other people and other nations. God has a reason for everything, and there was a reason for Israel to be different too. We're going to take a look more specifically about how Israel was different, how Jesus was different from what the world expected, and how we're also not to fit into the, the mold of the world either. 
So this week, my sermon in a sentence is this. Just as God did not want Israel to live or look like all the other nations, so too are we as Christians to be unlike those in the world. My first point this meeting, this morning is this, that we are to be different because Israel was different. So go back a moment to early on in Genesis. We learned about the patriarchs and how they became instrumental in the development of the Hebrew people. God chose Abram and made a covenant with him changing his name to Abraham and promising blessings of making him into a great nation with many children. This covenant continued on through his son and grandson. And so we repeatedly hear the Hebrew people referred to as children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These fathers marked the beginning of Israel being separated as God's people. God did not want his chosen people to be like the rest of creation. He wanted them to behave differently. He wanted them to be holy and acceptable before him. Now in the time that we found uh, Israel in Egypt, in the land of Pharaoh, they saw the Egyptians do many unclean things. And where they were headed, Canaan, there was a lot of stuff that was being done there that was wrong as well. This is why what we read in our passage this morning, God very clearly lays out, you are not to be like those where you were, and just in the same way, you are not to become like the people whom you in the place where I am taking you. You are to be set apart. He reminds his chosen people that they were not to follow the sins of mankind. In several of the commands, God wanted his people to stay away from the practices that pagan nations had adopted. Now, one of the things that I remember never hearing about offhand in the church, but that I learned in seminary, was the uniqueness of the nation of Israel back then. And how the nations all around them were pagan, polytheistic, uh, they worshipped many gods. They had gods for everything, basically, that you could imagine. See reference to that in the story of Gideon. There's one example. And yet out of this, God is calling them to be unique. And he's pointing to the fact that he alone is God. So one of the most basic things was that, as I said, they would worship only one, the true God. Many nations, I mean, we're, if you took any kinds of... Uh, History classes, I took a mythology class when I was in high school. Uh, they talk about the pantheons or the, the various gods that are worshipped. Now the Egyptians looked towards the spirits of animals and into nature, things that they evolved into gods. Specifically one of them, the sun god, Ra. Canaan wasn't good either. One of the most evil ceremonies that honored idols was that of offering children to the Canaanite fire god, Molech. There's no other way to describe this than evil. A metal statue with arms stretched out was heated until it was red hot, and children were burned on the burning arms. God had a simple offering, a simple solution for anyone who offered such a sacrifice. He says this in Leviticus chapter 20. Anyone from the sons of Israel or from the strangers residing in Israel who gives any of his children to Molech shall certainly be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. 
Some of the other religious customs that were taking place in Canaan at that time were the cutting and mutilating of oneself in the specific intent of capturing the intent or the attention of the gods. Understood. If you are not aware of this, understand this, that in these false religions, they would physically harm themselves in a way that they believed was drawing God or their God's attention to them. It was common for some to draw blood, shave their heads, or pull their hair out, making bald patches. These rituals were intended to get the idol's attention. More specifically, to get the idol to act. Like a rain dance. For example, would be another example that was not that uncommon in the pagan world. But God wanted Israel to understand that they didn't need to imitate the world. They didn't need to grab his attention. God is always watching his people. And we can trust him, and Israel could trust him to take care of their needs. Now Leviticus adds a bunch of other rules as well. Things like, don't wear two different kinds of cloth. Let's see if anybody's breaking that rule today. <laughs> uh, don't eat unclean animals. Don't turn to mediums or consult with the dead. They were intended to be a special people. The differences that God gave them were designed to focus the Israelites to think about God, to think about what God wanted for them, and to think about their place as God's chosen people. Secondly, we are called to be different because Jesus was different. Now, when Jesus arrived on the scene, he was very different than what the world expected. He didn't see the world like the Romans did. And he certainly didn't see the world like the Pharisees did. He looked at the world with new eyes. And he shared that view with us. For example, much of the Ten Commandments listed were things that we shouldn't do. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, all of that. But Jesus highlights the things that we should do. He says, when asked what the most important commandment was, he summarized it in this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now this may sound like some new piece of information. Maybe not to you, but maybe you're thinking, oh, he's come onto the scene, he's given something new. Well, no, the reality is he's quoting Old Testament passages. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It sounded new, but it was really the same old commands from the same God. But Jesus is showing it as a positive rule to follow. Have you ever had someone in your life come up to you and say, how do you reconcile the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament? Maybe you've had some of those same thoughts. In fact, my guess is that as you've gone through the growth process, there's no doubt that you've had that thought cross your mind before. But in, so in this case, when Jesus came, instead of focusing on what he wants us to avoid, he highlights what we are to do, how we are to be. He was bringing wisdom to a world that was struggling to see right from wrong. He was also different in how he treated sinners. He accepted those who most considered unacceptable. When the woman was caught in adultery and was brought to him, remember what the Pharisees asked him. They said, what should be done with her? 
Now, they knew the law. They knew what the law said. But Jesus, and so they're attempting to trap Jesus. This is one of the number of instances. Catch Jesus' response. He says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Probably, I would imagine, pretty familiar words because we hear those words in this building and we also hear this word used by people outside of the building as well. So he doesn't condemn the woman. He loves her. But he shows his love to such a degree that he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, I'm forgiven, I'm not going to condemn you, therefore go and just continue your life as you will. He finishes by saying this, and by the way, when the world says uses this passage to justify things, they conveniently leave this part out. He says, from now on, do not sin any longer. Jesus accepted the sinner, but rejected the sin. Instead of focusing on being clean, externally speaking, Jesus focuses on the heart. He said, go and sin no more. That's what repentance means. It means not continuing to make the same mistakes over and over again, but turning away from the sin to avoid the temptation, to switch sides, to remove the need for yourself to be in control of your life, to entrust all of life's goods and bads to God. It's finding a better way to live. A better way to follow God. Now, interestingly enough, another way that Jesus viewed the world a bit different than uh, the Pharisees in particular was on the Sabbath. So, what could be done, what can't be done. The Pharisees were very, uh, though I think they, it's even a word, pharisaical. They were very legalistic in what you could or could not do. Their purpose was not to honor or to learn from him, but to find fault. They challenged Jesus at every turn, specifically in places like when he healed the man on the Sabbath with the withered hand, or the woman with the bad back, or the blind man from birth. They challenged him when he and his disciples plucked heads of grain so that they could, so that could, be, they could be eaten on the Sabbath day. But when confronting the Pharisees, Jesus said, If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a whole person's body well? Do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. See, the Pharisees often interpreted the law. That was their role. And so they had decided long before this that no work was to be done on the Sabbath unless they okayed it. But eight days after a baby was born, or a boy, excuse me, a boy was born, he was circumcised even if it was the Sabbath. So, in their structuring of the system, they decided that it was fine for them to do that work because they felt like it was fine. But, in the same way, you were not allowed to pick grain in order to help others. Or for Jesus to perform miracles to heal people. They defined the rules that we read in Leviticus in a very rigid way that didn't take into account the intentions of the people. Jesus was different. His focus was to look at the inside of the person. But with all of that said, there's one way that was probably the 
uh, biggest way that Jesus was different. And he showed this when he declared who he was. So some Jews said, this is in John chapter 10, they said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus responds and says, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do are in my Father's name. They testify of me. But they could not accept who Jesus was, even when the answer was plainly right in front of them. They were looking for a worldly leader and couldn't bear the idea that Jesus didn't match what they thought a Messiah should look like. They didn't like the fact, in fact, they despised the fact to the point of wanting to kill him, the fact that he was, uh, he was tearing down the system that they had so carefully constructed for themselves to be in positions of authority. He didn't look right to them. He didn't act right to them. Jesus was different. And so the world rejected him. And finally, be different because we are different. So it's not just the Israelites that are called to be set apart, or that Jesus was different, set apart. But as believers, there are many things and ways that we are to stand out too. So now this is where the message, this last chunk here, is hopefully where it resonates the most with where you are. So I want to look at three ways that we are to be different from the world around us. First, as followers of Jesus, we are different because we cling to God while the world rejects him or rebels against him. Where we trust in the Bible as the written word of God, the world rejects ideas of absolutes. In fact, right and wrong is continually being redefined by secular ideas. Because we are now at the stage of the game where we are encouraging people to reimagine what is true. To redefine right and wrong as you see fit, as you feel. That's the Genesis 2 lie right there. Our world does not like absolutes, it doesn't like standards. And having only one God with Jesus as the only way to salvation is as firm and absolute as it gets. I met with a couple of guys this morning and we were reading through a list of some things that this author had written about fearing God. And the second phase in this author's writing was the realization that you cannot escape from standing and being accountable before God someday. And what I have witnessed, uh, in, in, even in some of our churches, is this uh, shift in belief that ultimately seeks to remove that fact from people's minds. It's understandable why that mindset would be lived by those in our culture. But to present this idea as though it doesn't really matter what you do, that in the end God will save you regardless, is a lie. That you need Jesus in your life. And yes, you will stand before God and account for everything you have said and done. A few years ago, uh, a Christian organization called Answers in Genesis. I don't know if have any of you been down. I have not been down to see the ark down there. That was built. Okay, I've been down there. So, um, 
They built a museum that, that shares the creation story. And so in, back in 2016, they built the ark. And both of them are in northern Kentucky. These, or these uh, museums that have been built are under constant attack from atheist organizations. Lawsuits surrounding hiring practices, tax codes, and even news articles that condemn the museum's practices. And many have tried to shut them down. It was interesting. This is unrelated, but I came across an article yesterday that someone had shared. Um, I don't know if they were trying to uh, get a response from me or not, but it was about uh, looking at all of the stuff that has happened um, in the, this ending period of time with the election. And this, this debate over what's really happened, what's the truth, and, and feeding into the idea that everything has been conspiracy. And so then the natural byproduct, which is understandable that when you remove truth from the picture, it becomes very, very difficult. And so I was not surprised and therefore not easily drawn in by this fact that this author had written an article that was saying that cre uh, creationism is, the, is really just an age-old conspiracy. The sinful world does not want to hear the truth. Nor do they want anyone else to hear it. So why is that? Why, 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 do, why do people care so much about what they hear to the point where they might even want to plug their ears if you're going to speak to them? It's because underneath it all, they don't want to be told and, or reminded that sin is a real thing. Because if that was the case, if they were made to understand that that was the case, that that was the case, now all of a sudden they have to ask themselves, just like we have to ask ourselves, what have I done with this life? What is the purpose of this life? Paul told us that the world rejects the truth. Not that we need that in this day and age. We understand that. I think it's pretty plain. But he wrote, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Through the Bible, God reveals to us that we are sinful. If you don't understand sin... You don't really understand why you even need a Savior. If you don't know you're on a dangerous path, you'll never change your course. We are different because we accept God's Word as truth. And we cling to Him for the good news that He brings to us. Secondly, we're different because we follow Jesus as our light to navigate this dark and sinful world. Around us are all kinds of evil. There's many unanswered questions. But one thing is obvious. Sin and evil are alive and well and have always darkened the earth. Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus, describing the sinful world. He says, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They have lost all sensitivity. So darkened in their understanding, it shows that the world is callous and is taken to sin. It doesn't seem like anything's wrong. And sometimes the world even glorifies this bad behavior. The world has become so des desensitized to all sorts of terrible things that they accept as normal what God calls evil. Following Jesus reveals the evil of our world and shows a path towards Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples, I am the light of the world. 
The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus tells us to repent and to avoid the temptation of this world, and he shows us the path to get to heaven. Does anybody know why the law was given to the Israelites? Commonly speaking, when we think of law, we might think primarily it was to tell them what was right and wrong, and that's part of it. But what's revealed to us later on is that it is the way that God chose to use to reveal to man that we are sinful and that we cannot do it on our own. Because the law required people to save, to, to try to save themselves rather than to allow God's grace to speak. And finally, we're different because we put our whole trust in Jesus. He's the only one that can save us from this sinful world and save us from ourselves. The law expected us, expected the people to cleanse themselves and offer sacrifices in order to be acceptable to God. The law required people to try to save themselves. But here's the truth, as Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 3. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Through the law, here it is, we become conscious of sin. We've all gone astray and can't find our way back to God. On our own accord, we don't know which way to go or how to get there. We might think of ourselves as good people, but we're really not. We're disobedient sinners just like everyone else. The only difference is we're saved by the grace of God. We have all fallen short and fall, or have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all done something wrong. We have all made mistakes and sinned and sometimes repeated them over and over again. We've done things that require and deserve punishment. All of us here and all of us outside could use a bit of grace. But fortunately for us, the story doesn't end there. For Christ also suffered for sins for once, for once for all time, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. The grace of Christ who died to save us from sin opens the path to heaven. The price has been paid. We're different because of our faith in Jesus. And it is our hope for today and our hope for the future. Grace saves us, and that's the good news that we treasure. In the time of Moses, and even today, we're called to live differently, with, uh, differently than the world around us. Because of the fact that Jesus lived differently, because he called the Israelites to live differently, and because when he saves us, we are set apart. As they said in the video, we are holy. God instituted those rules so that Israel would be brought closer to him and to be separated from godless practices. But he also showed that it was important to move, towards the, move our hearts towards God and not just make it look like we are following him. He shows us how to repent, how to forgive, how to have compassion, and how to love people. Our hope rests in Jesus as the one and only Savior who fulfilled the law and provided the good news that our sins are forgiven. We're different from the world. That's how God wants it to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for your law, Lord, and, and oftentimes we, we, uh, we balk at having a, a rules and authorities above us, Lord, uh, in, in the way that we act. Uh, even in rules that we sometimes find the benefit in, uh, when they become personal to us, we tend to resist and uh, find excuses as to why we are an exception to whatever the rule may be. Yet, Lord, we are 
thankful that the law that you gave was good. That law, the law was not sinful, but that it reveals to us that we are and that we need your grace. None of us here can have anything to boast upon except you. Lord, we seek that any pride that be in our hearts be rooted out. Help us to trust in you and to remember uh, what we were before you came into our lives. Help us daily to grow more and more into faithful followers uh, that you continue to entrust with more responsibility. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, please stand for the benediction and closing song. Just real quick, because I went a little longer than what I was planning to today. I'm going to just transition us into the meeting after the song, but if you need to leave or whatever, feel free to go out, but we'll just get right into stuff after the song. Okay? Uh, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. And remember, church, we are sent.